Monday, TMZ published surveillance video on its website that shows Rice beating his now wife, Janae Palmer, in an Atlantic City elevator. The incident happened last February. In late March, a grand jury indicted him on charges of aggravated assault. The next day, Rice and Palmer married. In May, Rice avoided formal prosecution after applying for a pretrial intervention program. If he completes that program, all the charges against him are said to be dismissed. Meanwhile, Rice continued all that time to practice with the Ravens. In June, Commissioner Roger Goodell met with Rice, and five weeks later, Goodell announced he'd suspended Rice from two games starting August 30th. On August 28th, after uh, experiencing some extreme criticism for the NFL's leniency in domestic violence cases, the league announced that there would be more severe punishments going forward. And Monday, it all came to a head when TMZ ran that video. It was just a matter of hours from the time the video went up until the Baltimore Ravens waived Rice and the NFL issued that indefinite suspension, ostensibly ending Rice's pro football career. Some in the media still don't think that's enough. Here is ESPN's Keith Olbermann. We begin tonight with the unavoidable and simple truth that intentionally or by neglect, the Atlantic County, New Jersey District Attorney's Office, the Baltimore Ravens, the National Football League, and Commissioner Roger Goodell have conducted a cover-up of Ray Rice's brutal assault on his then fiance on February 15th. There is no other conclusion possible. Each body, each leading individual involved, came to a judicial conclusion about what had happened to Janae Palmer and what should happen to Ray Rice. And each through deception or incompetence, misled the public, damaged the efforts of every man and every woman in this country seeking to merely slow down the murderous epidemic of domestic violence and made a mockery of the process by which those who batter those they claim to love are to be brought to justice. And not one of them, not Commissioner Goodell, not NFL Senior Vice President Adolfo Birch, not NFL Chief Counsel Jeff Pash, not Baltimore Team President Richard Cass, not Baltimore General Manager Ozzie Newsom, not Assistant Prosecutor Diane Ruberton of Atlantic County, New Jersey, not Prosecutor Jim McLean, not Superior Court Judge Michael Doino, not Ray Rice himself. No matter what actions were taken today against Rice, nor what might be taken in the future, none of them have any remaining credibility, and each must leave or be expelled from their current positions. And despite the obsession of the moment, it does not truly matter whether they had seen this video before today. The league, the team, the prosecutors either whitewashed Ray Rice's brutal assault without ever having seen this video, or they saw the video and whitewashed Rice's brutal assault anyway. Overman's uh, commentary there goes on for about another four minutes. You can watch or listen to the entire thing on our links blog at kbia.org. Let's talk about the coverage of this story as we've seen it really unfold from February until now. Well, one of the things that, that I want to do first is commend yeah. ESPN for the coverage that it's given to this. Uh, usually in cases like this, especially involving the NFL, which I think is, is ES, one of ESPN's top brands mm -hmm. uh they sort of back off on this but on this one they were on top of it they were they were forceful about what should happen before the nfl made its decision before baltimore made its decision they've covered it from top to bottom now i also have to condemn them a little bit because they could have done some more reporting on this further back uh and pushed to get that that video themselves and in, in that regard, I would have to commend TMZ because they did go out and do that. Uh, so those are the first couple of things that I want to talk about in terms of the coverage. Uh, other than that, they've done a pretty good job, as well as the rest of the media, in covering the issue of domestic violence and what it means to not only the, 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 the victim, but also to the system as a whole. Uh, the other thing is that they're coming down pretty hard on Roger Goodell. And I think that that's that should they should be commended for. But I also want they should understand that he works for the owners. And as long as he's doing certain things for the owners, they're going to want to keep him around. I will agree that with ESPN's coverage has been better. I will even say with Olbermann, I mean, you know, this is one of his typical rants. He's not, nothing if not bombastic. I remember from his MSNBC days, his indictments of President Bush and all this kind of stuff. But I can't disagree with any of the points that he made basically about who's culpable in all of this. And I think he, d he didn't indict the media, which is one thing he might also have done. 
and has done in the past. I do think that reporters were awfully quick to, you know, allow the NFL to try to craft the message the way they wanted to. And, good, and, and you know, I think the commissioner is nothing if not someone who's looking out for the brand. That's all he cares about when it comes to concussions or sexual assault. It's pretty obvious that those two issues are way down the ladder and preserving the NFL's image is really a priority. I'd also say about TMZ, at some point, whether we like their methods or not, whether we like the fact that they pay for content and they brag about doing mm -hmm. that, they have become a legitimate news organization. And when it comes to covering sports, I mean, look what they've been. Just in the last year, the, the Donald Sterling year. story, that was truly broken by TMZ. The evidence in this story coming to light, coming from TMZ. And, but I think part of that goes to the fact that they are beholding to the leagues, be it basketball, football, baseball, whatever, they aren't beholden to those leagues because, in terms of contracts. And I think that's one of the things that sort of hinders, whether consciously or subconsciously, it hinders the way in which the, the mainstream news organizations and, and the sports organizations yeah. cover it because they also have those contracts. Perhaps from the broadcast perspective, yes, but there are plenty of traditional print legacy news organizations known for their investigative reporting. Now we're seeing some of that online. Are they beholden in that same way that an ABC or a CBS or an NBC might be? I don't think that they're necessarily beholden, but they have a legacy of, of working very closely with them and having access. And that's where I think the problem comes in is that if you cover it very extensively, if you're, you're there on an everyday basis, you build these relationships and those relationships are supposed to be sort of hands off. But in a lot of ways, because of the closeness, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty tight. You don't see certain things or you sort of gloss over certain things that you shouldn't be doing, uh, especially when it comes to cases like this. I mean, the, the the Baltimore beat writers who were covering the Ravens should have been on this thing top to bottom, and that didn't happen. And, and they, they were in their reaction to this video. I mean, they did comprehensive reporting on it, but that's too much of what we're seeing these days, reacting to the news rather than you know being out there in front of the news. TMZ, by the way, just before we leave them, I'll say maybe this is one of those times when not knowing their corporate parentage gives them an advantage. They're owned by Time Warner. The same people that own CNN and a lot of other traditional brands. And HBO that has right. reality programming associated right. with but they're perceived as being this maverick entity that can go out there and because they've been focused on Hollywood for the most part in the past, they get away with a lot of things. And I think they've actually served the public by having that brand, that image. But I also, I also have to commend, uh, commend the parent company for giving them the, the, where, the, the tools to do that. Giving, letting them be hands off. Uh, letting and letting them, them do and, them. Let them let, exactly. Letting them be who they are and not coming in and corporatizing them is probably the best way to put that. One of the things that I guess is disturbing about this whole thing is the fact that it really did take the release of the second video, actually seeing the physical assault, not just the aftermath of it, that finally gets people to focus some attention on the story. And interestingly enough, you know, Roger Goodell says he hadn't seen it, the owners hadn't seen it. But the real action didn't happen until we saw it, until the general public saw it, until it had been published. So that's kind of troublesome, too, that until it was really out there in the open, that there was reaction. Well, one of the things people are saying is it's one thing to, to talk about it. It's another thing to see it. Mm -hmm. And when people actually saw him hit her on video, that, they were like, whoa, you know. Saying the word abuse is one thing, but seeing the actual abuse itself, that just opens up a whole new new light on, on the situation. Here's what surprises me, though. I don't know if the NFL, if Goodell or his legal counselor and those folks actually saw the video ahead of time or not. We they said they that. haven't. We right. won't know. But they did see, and we all saw, the video of Rice dragging Janae Palmer out of the elevator. Which okay? should have been enough. So they knew what happened. And so they surely had to believe that if TMZ and the casino and probably lawyers had access to him dragging her out, they probably had access to video within the elevator. If they wanted to know, they could have known it existed, and they certainly should well, have the prepared th for the fact the that thing. it would they, come out. They knew that the, the, the videotape existed. They asked for the videotape and were not granted access to it. That's one of the things that they, that, that they have admitted to. What I want to know is, okay, if you knew that the videotape existed, why didn't you go to Ray Rice and ask him, what's on that tape? 
what actually happened in that in, in the elevator. I want you to describe to me as an as the NFL investigator who's going to make the decision on whether or not you get to because play Because the grand again, jury most likely on, saw it. Exactly. Yeah. What's on that tape? And those are the questions that if, if I was covering it, I would be asking Roger Goodell and the NFL investigators is, did you ask Ray Rice specifically what happened in that elevator? I want you to describe to me what happened. I think there's an interesting ethical question that comes out of this whole thing. And we've seen the video. The video is what it took, I guess, to generate this kind of concentration on the issue. But on the other hand, the, the television media have been showing this video over and hey, over nausea. again in a continuous loop. And, you know, Jan Janae Palmer says, you're basically ruining my life. Some people are saying we are re-victimizing her by showing this video over and over. I think there's some truth to that. The question is, how do we balance that between her privacy and her welfare and the right of the public to talk about this issue and to call the NFL to account for You know, it. I think we saw a little bit of that in the coverage in the days after 9-11, in the months and the years, and interestingly enough, discussing this on September 10th, we showed video of planes going into buildings. We did that for a couple of weeks. I would probably say being in the newsroom, by the end of the month of September, we had a moratorium on that video to never use it or show it again. I, I think we're almost at a point where maybe we need to consider something similar as an industry to begin to wean off using this. I agree. I think that's something that we're going to have to do. But And in doing that, we also need to talk about these are things that happen on a daily basis to people who are not in the national spotlight. It's good that we're talking about it, but what more are we going to do? And that's where I think the media does have a responsibility to talk about domestic violence on a on a local level and and really focus in on that and how they can help citizens to push this issue forward you know, we talk on a lot of these big stories that come up on our show lately about social media and what impact they had on it. I think we ought to focus just a little bit on that, too. First of all, the fact that most people were aware of this video and this story probably came through social media. Mm -hmm. And secondly... If you want to talk about having a real positive impact for good, look at those hashtags that emerged, why I stayed or why I left. Just read a little bit of that and how it's been shared, and you can see how it's possible. I'm not saying it will happen, but it's possible this time, this case of domestic violence might actually make a difference in how we respond to it.